Let's see. We got What's that? Oh, I rotate him over to that one. They get the stale ones. <laughs> Hello. Okay, Mr. Clerk. Uh, everyone is here and present. We'll begin the uh, planning committee meeting of Akron City Council um, here promptly, I believe, 1.30. Uh, Mr. Clerk, uh, what we'd like to do is entertain a motion. We accept the minutes of the previously held meeting. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Against? The ayes have it. Thank you. We have uh, four items that are up for a public hearing this afternoon, and um, we will have an additional public hearing at 7 o'clock this evening. Everyone here is invited, of course, to that 7 o'clock meeting. What we'll do before these public hearings is those that wish to testify before the committee uh, will be asked to be sworn in by a representative of our law department. We'll do that here right now at 1.30. Can somebody please close the door? We'll do that at 1.30, and then again, we'll repeat that at 7 o'clock in terms of swearing you in before you testify. This afternoon, we will not make a recommendation to council. However, after the 7 o'clock public hearing, we will make a recommendation. This committee will make a recommendation to all of council in terms of either to approve, to disapprove, or uh, just table the idea, refer it to another meeting later on. So those are the, uh, that's the procedures. I hope I didn't miss anything. Um, with that, I would like to ask if there's anyone here uh, that would like to testify before the committee today, uh, please stand and be sworn in by a representative of our law department. If you will speak today at the public hearings, please stand, raise your right hand, and answer in the affirmative. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth? Thank you. Thank you, representative from our law department. <laughs> Again, we have four items that are up for public hearing this afternoon. The first item is the ordinance authorizing a conditional use to expand a restaurant and construct a new retail building at 1006 South Arlington Street. Mr. Antonucci. Mr. Chairman, committee members, uh, James Brooks, the owner of the Corral Restaurant, is requesting to expand his existing restaurant to the west along with constructing a separate retail building to the north of, the, uh, of his existing building. The Corral Restaurant comprises 1,447 square feet of area. The petitioner proposes to raise the northernmost portion of that building and add a new 725 square foot addition uh, to the western elevation of, the, of that structure. The total size of the building would comprise 2,030 square feet. Uh, a drive up window would be added uh, along the North Firestone Boulevard elevation. Um, the new 2,640 square foot retail building will be constructed 14 feet to the north of the existing, res existing restaurant. The building will consist of three equal sized storefronts. Construction materials would include face brick, ha uh, hardy board siding, stone veneer, and a standing seam metal roof. An enclosed dumpster will be sited behind the setback south of the Austin Avenue right-of-way. One goal of the Land Use and Development Guide Plan is to promote uh, the preservation and revitalization of viable business districts by providing viable shopping areas with room for businesses to expand their facilities and promoting good design standards for buildings signage and parking areas. The Corral restaurant was built in 1950 and the expansion will allow for a larger kitchen area and drive up window. 
in order to buffer the retail activity from the residential properties to the west. A new six feet solid wooden fence would be installed along the western property line. The site plan meets code requirements regarding the amount of off street parking. Planning staffs are the opinion that the proposed development and modernizing improvements will enhance the property and this neighborhood along this retail, older retail corridor and planning staff recommends approval while planning commission recommends disapproval. Thank you, Mr. Antonucci. At this time, we'll open up the public hearing portion and ask if there's anyone here that wishes to speak in favor of the conditional use request at 1006 Arlington Street, South Arlington. Is there anyone here wishing to speak in favor? Yes, sir, if you could please come to the microphone up here and um, we will provide, if you could please provide us with your name and address. And we my appreciate name is Carson Barnes. My address is 795 South Hawkins in Akron, zip code 20. Um, I am uh, born and raised here in Akron, 1948. Um, on the east side, uh, Milton Court. Uh, many days, uh, our family had uh, sandwiches at the at the corral. Growing up as part of our tradition to uh, do business with that restaurant. Uh, uh, as a teenager uh, at East High School, and I'm a 66 graduate of East, uh, as was my parents, as was my daughter. One, went to Garfield, but you know, I won't hold that against her. Uh, I support the project because uh, as a um, development director for the East Acker Neighborhood Development Corporation for uh, about seven years, uh, I saw the uh, deterioration, as it were, of that neighborhood, particularly the commercial area of uh, Arlington Street. Uh, to, my, to my dismay, believe me, um, that site is uh, historic just, to, just in terms of it being there. And I think uh, this, the speaker uh, indicated that the property was built in 1950. I believe it was 1934. I may stand corrected on that, but I think it was the 30s. And uh, we're fortunate to have many businesses here in Akron that maintain that long tradition. It's part, it's the fabric, you know, like Al Alexander's Body Shop, for example, on the north side. It's uh, Bob's Hamburgers on East uh, Avenue. We uh, are a city of tradition. So say that to say that the uh, corral uh, meets that uh, that criterion as being a um, uh, historic property and a tradition in the community. Um, economic development, I think uh, we need it. It goes without saying. We need more businesses in East Akron. It's a historic site. Um, uh, as a community person, I support it. Um, I don't, I haven't read anything about uh, uh, adverse impacts of traffic, either ingress or egress, sound, noise level, decibel. I haven't been apprised of anything like that. Um, the site plans that the architects have uh, developed seem to describe in detail um, what is anticipated as far as that project is concerned. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting a neighbor uh, adjacent to that property yesterday. He has some legitimate concerns, but I, th I think uh, in view of that, the, the project could be, should be approved uh, with all deference to this gentleman who owns uh, 
who lives next door. Uh, and not exactly next door, because of course there is a, a property separating the corral from his property. But with all due respect to this uh, gentleman, uh, consideration is being given to his concerns uh, in terms of the design and all of that, I think, up to this point, because it's been, the project's been pared back. Uh, Very good. So. Thank you, Mr. I, Barnes. Thank you. Thank you for your time, certainly. Thank you. Anyone else here wishing to speak in favor? Please step forward, if you can please provide for the committee your name and address. Happy holidays, everybody. My name is David Yedetsian, architect. Uh, myself and Mr. Bernie Kamenier right behind me were uh, uh, instrument in uh, developing a site plan as well as some elevation renderings and some building plans for Mr. Brooks' dream of expanding his property. Uh, the project has been through the depart several departments here and favorably approved. Uh, we have gone through circulation studies, we have gone through impact studies, as well as design uh, criteria to fit the neighborhood. And I think the neighborhood needs a shot in the arm. It needs to be uh, elevated in terms of site planning, landscaping, et cetera, et cetera. And I think the plan before you speaks for itself in terms of its viability. Uh, granted, there is much more work to be done in terms of marketing, uh, in terms of uh, logistics as far as who is going to go in, in the new facilities. But for sure, Mr. Brooks needs to expand his ex existing historical building, which is very cornerstone of that whole area. People recognize it as being there for almost uh, umpteen years. Still looks good. It's very, very uh, distinguished in design. We like to maintain that. We like the addition to complement what is there. So with that, I'm going to turn it to Mr. Cameron here to say a few words, and if there are any questions. Thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll entertain those after the public hearing, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, sir. Anyone else wishing to speak in favor? My name is Bernard Kamenier. David and I have prepared the drawings which have been approved by the uh, committee, the traffic engineer, and the zoning official. Mike Antonucci, I've known for many years, enjoyed working with him, admire him, and respect him. He would not have approved this site plan if it wasn't properly prepared. I don't want to take up any of your time. The councilman for the seventh ward will sponsor the legislation to officially approve the program and allow the owner to get busy with the heavy lifting, the financing, the plans, the contracting, and the potential users of the new building which is proposed. We intend to elevate the quality of the neighborhood, but I think what we have prepared is compatible with the needs of the neighborhood and we would be happy to continue working on the project. Uh, if there are any questions, we have the owner here, Mr. Brooks, and uh, we would like very much to uh, pursue this project to a successful completion, which would benefit everyone, the principals, the neighborhood, 
the neighbors, The site has been neglected for too long. Hopefully we will continue to march upward. And I think the value of the real estate in this neighborhood would increase appreciably with the preparation and installation of a new building. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anyone else here wishing to speak in favor of the proposal? Anyone in favor? Very good. Anyone wishing to speak against the uh, proposal at 1009 South Arlington Street? Anyone here wishing to speak against? Yes. Can you please provide for the committee your name and address? I can't hear you, sir. If you could please provide for the committee your name and address. My name is Stephen Papua. I live next door to 970 Austin Avenue. I tried to buy the empty lot next door from the land bank that I cut grass, maintain, weed, and feed for 14 years since I built my new house behind my first house at 969 North Firestone Boulevard. <clears throat> Let me clean my glasses. First of all, I want to address Mr. Barnes. Uh, I believe the spot was the first drive-in restaurant across the street, uh, directly south of the corral. <clears throat> my house was built in 1931. It was my old house on Firestone Boulevard. It was a 1931 Sears catalog house, <clears throat> where you actually opened the catalog and ordered it. <clears throat> uh, we'll rehash what we had at the rezoning meeting, where we had three no's and one yes. Uh, I received the, re the zoning meeting letter three days before the Friday 9 o'clock meeting. I received this letter with the 7 o'clock meeting without the 1.30 meeting, which I was told uh, by one of the council members that that had to be an error. We'll make sure it doesn't happen again because I was uh, not uh, per code. <clears throat> I am. I'm five years from graduating high school and going to work at Firestone High School. I am blue collar, the last of the Akronites, the true Akronites. I bought my first home, 1995, at 969 North Firestone Boulevard. Everyone owned their homes, cut their grass, took care of it. The older people moved or died, went to nursing homes. The young kids bought the house with the recession. They lost their jobs, lost their houses. Now. It's a lot of rental property that nobody really cares about the neighborhood. More than 40 homes in my neighborhood went to bankruptcy, foreclosure, and now rentals. I saved my money like old school. Back in the day, there was no bank to, to, to get a loan to buy a house, to build a house, to buy an empty lot. You saved your money. Again, I'm old school, blue collar, acronite. I built a brand new house for me and my son and wife at the time. I've lost over 36%, $50,000 in value in my house. I'm going to lose another 10 to 20% when I wake up tomorrow and have a commercial business, a fast food drive through two to three feet off my property line, 12 to 15 feet from my bedroom window and my son's bedroom window. I can pull the minutes and I'll bring that to the next meeting here if I can get them before seven o'clock, but Mr. Brooks in their zoning meeting wants to restore the glory days of the corral. 7 a.m. to 4 a.m. Arlington Road's a ghost town after 9 o'clock. I have eight, 78 signatures and I have a survey of Arlington Road. And I can have, have them out to council. Bear with me here. I don't do this every day, so I'm a little nervous. Yeah. There we go. There are 16 car lots on Arlington Street between I-76 and Waterloo Road. 
there's eight fast food, seven fast food drive throughs and a Walgreens for drugs prescription. They all have a buffer, uh, all but one. Here we go, I'm sorry. There's 16 empty buildings on Arlington between Waterloo and I-76. Five I could not confirm because they were boarded up. Someone either bought and boarded up because they were breaking into or using it for personal storage as they do not have visible business signs or phone numbers. Mr. Brooks could easily buy the old KFC at 983 and I can hand these out. I got five, but I can bring more back at seven o'clock meeting, which I'll attend. 16 addresses are legitimately closed. The Red Sun Buffet, three blocks down, has three empty units. 16 car lots, five beer drive throughs seven food, one Walgreens drive through and they all have buffers but one. Austin Avenue is not wide enough like North Firestone Boulevard to accommodate the traffic. Most people park on the street, so you're, you're down to a lane and a half. So with all these people pull, pulling south off, or uh, west off of Arlington Road, it could be a safety issue, which the city engineer, the road engineer, should have a, have a look at these plans too, because I don't see you have a backup on the Arlington Road. Uh, I can come and give you guys the yes, 18 sir. signatures. Thank you, yeah, we'll get a copy of that to everyone, thank you. I only brought five copies, but. It's no problem, sir. We um, have a few more uh, public hearings this afternoon. No, one's the uh, survey with the addresses. Uh, if we go back to. Uh, sir, sir, yeah, I said we have a couple more public hearings. If we could just, if you don't mind. I, finish, I respectfully sir? request that. Can I finish? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's what I'm asking you to do. I'll sum it up in four minutes. Thank you. Well, for, well, we'd like to. Can I finish in four minutes, sir, please? Well, that's, usually we permit three, four, five minutes or whatever, and we're, well, we have a lot of public hearings. So please, please proceed. Okay. I'm going to lose another 10, 20% in value when I wake up tomorrow with a commercial property next to me. Some banks will not even loan a mortgage to a house next door to a commercial property. Who's going to compensate me when I lose 70, 80,000 of my value of my house I bought for my family? Gone down the drain. I lose more value than I can pay off. I can't refinance. Should I just man up and, and file bankruptcy? No, I'm a bigger man than that. Blue collar acronite. I'm a civil engineer in construction and know a couple guys in here. I won't point them out in order to defame their names here, but Mr. Brooks is going to spend almost 150 bucks a square foot to build this. I can go rent the Red Sun Buffet for $15 a square foot plus $4 maintenance plus I got to pay utilities. To rent his new building, it's $29 plus utilities. If he wants to promote business, why doesn't he go buy one of those other 16 empty properties? and help a guy out. Hey, here's low rent. I want to see you stand up and have your business. And Grady with the East Akron Corporation, I worked with him with Testa Builders for 25 years. I built many homes. I did two additions to the East Side community. Grady is a great man, still in my mind today, but this is only going to degrade my value, my neighborhood, and do nothing but harm the neighborhood. Any questions? Very good. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Is there anyone else here wishing to speak against the proposal at 1009 South Arlington Street? Anyone wishing to speak against? Very good. We'll close the public hearing. Open up for questions. Mr. Antonucci, um, we, uh, I see that there's like 20 restrictions, deed, or excuse me, uh, conditional use restrictions on this, 21, I believe. Is part of that, Part of the uh, conditions, the um, uh, fence is there fencing or some kind of buffering at least between the residential neighborhood behind on the west side of the property? Uh, yes, there's a request for we will need a landscape condition for a landscape and fencing plan, and then there's a performance bond that will need to be posted to make sure that that work is done. Very good. Okay, good. Um, also, did the uh, traffic engineer get an opportunity to review? Uh, the traffic patterns around this particular property? Traffic engineer did review it. We looked, he looked at a couple plans that were submitted and we made sure that it, it, it met his uh, conditions. Okay, very good.
very good. And I just want to uh, let the, the committee know that uh, one of the folks that had stood up this afternoon had uh, mentioned the notification. And uh, I know uh, President Somerville and myself had, had spoke, and uh, the law department has weighed in. And we will be notifying everyone moving forward in terms of the, uh, the 130 meetings, um, not just the 7 o'clock. Uh, public hearings when it comes to conditional use requests. So with that, um, uh, I will open up to any questions or comments from anyone at this point. Anyone on the committee? Ms. Um Sorry, Mr. Kilby. Um, I was here the morning that the planning commissioners heard the case, and I'm trying to remember what exactly were their concerns. The recommendation, well, we had three members that voted no and right. one who voted in favor. Right. And planning staff recommendation was approval, is right. approval. But do you remember what the concerns they expressed were? Uh, I believe they were, they had some concerns about uh, um, just the, the neighborhood in, in and of itself and um, the, they actually, you know, there, there was some question as to whether or not the, the the property could be developed properly. Hmm. And the planning staff apparently has determined that there's enough space between the We parties. feel there is, and this actually adding the land makes this a more modern, viable retail business and will improve the property, we okay. feel. And so we have an opportunity here to actually improve on this, on this retail property. And you know, there, yeah, there are some businesses that are struggling along Arlington Street, but you know, this is an opportunity. I see. Okay. Uh, for the question, anything else, no. Ms. Moby? No. Any other questions or comments from committee members? Okay, Mr. Kilby. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Antonucci, you said uh, you are requiring a buffer between this building and this other property, what does that consist of, a buffer? Well, it'd be a solid wood fence, at least a solid fence. How high? Six feet. Just. Okay. Do you really think that's gonna be enough to prevent the noise? It's, it's actually, it's, it is a standard, essentially, in the code. We have a landscape buffer between a retail yeah. business and a residential Would property. Would it be possible and that's to the standard. require a, uh, you know, like, doesn't have to be that high, but along the expressway, you see these here sound barriers. Would it be possible to require a real sound barrier type fence rather than just a six foot uh, fence there? Well, I suppose at this point that would be up to city council. Yeah, because it just seems like the main objection is the noise of a drive through at four o'clock in the morning. And But uh, I just think that's something that maybe somebody should look into. Okay. Uh, any further questions or comments? Yes. Uh, sorry, sir. Uh, the public hearing portion is closed. I'd be happy to talk with you after the meeting. Uh, plus, there's an opportunity. I'd like to invite everyone back this evening at 7 o'clock where we'll have an additional public hearing. Very good. Further questions or comments from anyone? Okay. Again, I'll invite everyone back this, this evening at 7 o'clock which will have a uh, public hearing afterwards. The committee will make a recommendation to council. Now, we'll now move on to item number two, which is authorizing conditional use to establish an auto repair business at 248 Cole Avenue. Mr. Antonucci. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee members. Uh, Valerie Zavodny is proposing to use this building for an auto repair business. The 6,480 square foot, one story building is constructed of concrete block and sited along the west property line. Paved parking areas with sufficient space for about a dozen vehicles are located to the north and east of the building. Property is accessed through existing curb cuts along Cole Avenue and Bellows Street. The majority of the property is, is enclosed by chain link fencing and gated at the entrance drives. The building contains two garage bay doors along the east elevation with office space at the northeast corner of the building. Goals of the Land Use and Development Guide Plan include promoting and preserving viable business districts. The proposed tenant, Pearl and Glass Revelations, is an auto body and mechanical repair business. Uh, currently, they have two auto repair body shops on Grant Street. However, they are in need of more space 
and wish to relocate uh, to this location. The past uses of the building include chateau maintenance and crown tile. Property is well secured and the layout of the well-maintained building is suitable for auto repair and body work. As such, the proposed use should not negatively impact the surrounding uses. Uh, the proposed use is an appropriate reuse of a vacant commercial building and the planning staff can support this request and both planning commission and planning staff recommend approval subject to conditions. Thanks, Mr. Antonucci. At this time, we'll open up for public hearing. Is there anyone here wishing to speak in favor of the conditional use request at 248 Coal Avenue? Anyone here wishing to speak in favor? Anyone? In favor of 248 Coal Avenue? Anyone? Okay, very good. Anyone wishing to speak against the proposal at 248 Coal Avenue? Anyone here wishing to speak against the proposal at 248? Anyone against? Very good. Hearing none, we'll close the public hearing. Is there any questions or comments from any committee members at this time? Mr. Kamer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mike, my question is to you. Obviously, nobody has showed up to speak today in favor or against, but I just want to know. I know we talked before, and for the record, uh, and they might show up this evening, but during the uh, planning commission, no one showed up either? That's correct. Okay. So have you heard? I, yeah, I was. I did talk to the petitioner. They, I was expecting him to be here this afternoon, but I would imagine they'll be here tonight. I would hope. Oh, very good. Oh, you don't have to, but it's kind of helpful. <laughs> so, and, and, did you get sworn in? If uh, did you get sworn in? Oh, did you? You're welcome to. Absolutely. We. It's kind of untraditional that we'll open up the public, reopen the public hearing. Traditionally, we try to stick to the rules, extremely close, but um, uh, we'll be more than happy to anyway, so. absolutely hear you out. That's, okay. And plus, you're invited back this evening at 7. So, so the, the business that was there previously, Chateau, is, is it's been located. So the building, um, the, we're currently for a retail space which doesn't make a whole lot of sense for how large the building is, the way that it's laid out, et cetera. And everyone that's come to look at the building is looking to do something um, more like what, you know, everyone, I've had almost everyone that's looked at it wants to do some type of, whether it's just auto detailing, auto repair. Um, so the retail just doesn't really make any sense for that size of a building. Um, it just, it seems, silly to have the building sit empty and vacant. Um, it's been well taken care of, upkept, in not so great of an area for a really long time, and I'd hate to see it sit vacant rather than have somebody come in and keep it the way that we've kept it for all these years. So I have somebody interested. I've had actually multiple people interested um, in the building, and it, it would just be nice to be able to get somebody in there that's gonna keep it and take care of the property. Very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mr. Kamen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just, I do have a few questions because obviously the communication just hasn't been there, so I appreciate. Uh, I didn't get the name or address for the record, and the individual just, just spoke. Is she just the property owner from uh, 248 Cole Avenue, or are you the business owner of the two body shops? 248 Cole Avenue. Okay. Um, well, my concerns are I, I would really like to hear from the potential two body shop owners that are going to move at 248 Cole. I believe 248 Cole Avenue is a very, very nice, beautiful property on uh, that street that is well upkept and uh, fenced in and the building is very sound, structural, uh, and it's really nice in the neighborhood. So I just, like moving forward, my concerns are, I would just like to hear from the two body shop uh, individuals. So that's it. Okay, so thanks. thanks. Any other questions or comments? Any other? Okay, very good. We'll now move on to item number four. Uh, item number four is authorizing conditional use to park a commercial box truck at 1156 Reed Avenue. Oh, we, we skipped item three. Skip, I'm sorry. Skip three. Oh, is there a number three here? Okay, let's go back. 
Oh, very good, thank you. Uh, number three is the next public hearing. I apologize, I jumped ahead. Uh, number three is authorizing conditional use to establish a dumpster rental business at the southeast corner of the intersection of East Exchange and Fountain Street. Mr. Chairman, committee, committee members, the petitioner is proposing to construct a dumpster rental business on the property. The city is the owner of the property and would sell this property to the petitioner contingent upon this conditional use approval. The property would be sold to the petitioner for the price of $92,000. Budget Dumpster is a Northeast Ohio based company which currently operates in 46 states. Uh, they deliver affordable waste removal services in most major markets. Uh, they transport temporary roll-off dumpsters for rent. Uh, their dumpsters are typically used for customers who need to remove scrap and debris for home and business construction and clean up projects. There would be no transport to or sorting of scrap materials on this site. The property would be used as a yard and maintenance facility to support the company's fleet vehicles and equipment. Uh, phase one of construction would include securing the site with a fence and automatic gate, cleaning up the property and improving the pavement. Phase two would involve the construction of an approximately 3,500 square foot vehicle maintenance repair shop and 1,250 square foot office building. Um, the primary access to the facility would be from Fountain Street. Uh, the storage yard would be situated south of the proposed building. There would be secondary gated access to the storage drive onto Krause Street. The dumpster storage area would be screened from view with solid fencing from all sides of the property. This property has been left vacant for several decades and is a former South uh, State Route 8 right of way. The proposed use would be compatible with surrounding uses, provided the storage of the dumpsters and trucks are suitably screened from view from the street and neighboring properties, and the dumpsters are thoroughly emptied and cleaned before coming on site and not used for the purpose of containing food or organic waste and uh, both planning commission and planning staff recommend approval subject to conditions. Very good, thank you. Now I'll the public hearing. Is there anyone here wishing to speak in favor of the conditional use request? Um, well, uh, please provide for us your name and address. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. My name is Drew Siley with Liberty Development Company. We manage uh, real estate and development on behalf of Budget Dumpster. Uh, with me is John Fenn, who is the CEO and co-founder of Budget Dumpster. Uh, my address is 28045 Rainy Parkway, Westlake, Ohio. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. My name is John Fenn. I'm the uh, owner and founder of Budget Dumpster. I live at 29647 Lake Road in Bay Village, uh, outside of Cleveland. Um, and as, as Drew had mentioned, um, we'd like to have an operations center um, a hub uh, where we can keep, uh, keep our trucks. All of our equipment would be brand new. Um, we'd construct a new building, obviously, and everything would be uh, contained within uh, that property uh, with a, a, a fenced and screened uh, a barrier. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anyone else here wishing to speak in favor of the conditional use request? Anyone here wishing to speak in favor? Anyone wishing to speak against? Anyone wishing to speak against? Okay, very good. We'll close the public hearing portion, invite you back this evening at 7. Uh, is there any questions or comments? I have a couple quick ones here. I had noticed, Mr. Antonucci, in your report, you had indicated that there is no, um, <clears throat> no food or no, if you could. Yeah, that's correct. These, these kind of, these dumpsters are the kind of dumpsters you'll see at like construction sites for, for like debris and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. They're going to be emptied out before they show up on the property there. Um, these aren't the kind of dumpsters that would sit outside a restaurant or something like that. They're not okay. those. So, so, so whenever to make sh make sure that the, these aren't food, Thank food you. So, whenever they're stored on site, there will not be anything. There will not be trash or what have you, or yeah, construction I'm, material or nothing. Great. Just the um, these uh, uh, bins or whatever larger. That's correct. I'm told they're cleaned out before they would come to okay, on site. Okay, that's correct. Okay, Can you very want me to good. elaborate on that at all? Very good. I, no, I, was, I was asking Mr. Okay. Antonucci. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Um, okay, good. So, um, and is there, uh, again, there's there's 18 or so conditions here. There's buffering, correct? That's correct. Okay, very good. Uh, questions or comments from any committee members or council members at this time? Any questions? Very good, thank you. Again, we'll invite you back this evening at seven o'clock in which the committee will make a recommendation to all council. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Four is authorizing a conditional use to park a commercial box truck at 1156 Reed Avenue. Mr. Antonucci. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee members. Misty Grider is uh, requesting permission to park a commercial box truck on this res residentially zoned property, uh, single family home. Uh, after a complaint was lodged with the zoning division on June 21st, 2018, regarding the parking of a commercial vehicle, that this property, a courtesy letter was issued to this owner. Uh, the petitioner now has, has acknowledged that a commercial box truck is parked at the property, and uh, the owner further states that the truck is used for their power washing business. Um, due to the so uh, due their commercial ve vehicles and residential through their size, commercial vehicles in residential neighbor neighborhoods can be unsightly and a blighting influence. The size can also pose safety issues. This dense residential neighborhood is characterized by 45 foot wide lots with narrow driveways leading to detached garages. There are ample nearby commercially zoned areas uh, for the petitioner to store their commercial vehicle and both planning commission and planning staff recommend disapproval. Thanks Mr. Antonucci. We'll now open up the public hearing. Is there anyone here wishing to speak in favor of the conditional use request 1156? Read. Anyone here wishing to speak in favor? Anyone? Anyone wishing to speak in favor? Anyone wishing to speak against? 1156 read. Anyone against? Anyone? Okay. Very good. We'll close the public hearing portion and now open up to any uh, committee members who may have questions or council members who may have questions. Ms. Mobian. Following the commissioner's meeting, are, are the um, petitioners notified of the results of that meeting? When the planning commissioner's meeting? Yes. They are notified of what the And they're also notified of this meeting as well. But they, they are notified of the recommendation or non-recommendation. Uh, they're not officially sent a letter or anything to that effect but we do have communication with the petitioners often. No, I just mean they, they know when it's scheduled and they, they know can when it's attend scheduled. That's, co that's correct. either or both. That's correct. They're, they're given notification of those meetings as well. Right. But are they notified after the commissioner's meeting of the We results? don't send anything as okay. official on that, no. But they can always call and find out. That, that, that's correct. Okay. Thank you. Further questions or comments? Uh, yes. Samples? Thank you. So I've been out to the um, Miss Geiger's um, home. I've seen the box truck. It's not a huge box truck. Um, they use it for their painting. That's probably why they're not here because they're self-employed. Um, I've been out to their house several times, and um, it doesn't obstruct vision going up and down the street. They have also offered to put it on the other side of the fence. Um, the only reason they hadn't put it on the other side of the fence, as you and I know, and there's an ongoing battle between them and the neighbor is where this all really originated from. So I just want that on the record that I just don't want them to be penalized because of them having an ongoing battle with the neighbor because the box truck is not that big. Um, they have offered to park it on the other side of the fence and it does not obstruct um, vision to or fro down Reed Street, Reed Avenue. Thanks. Thank you. For the questions or comments, I did get a phone call from a Mrs. Sullivan who resides on Reed Avenue who stated uh, wanted for the record to, it, to be known that she was in favor. In favor. Thank you. Okay. Um, with that, uh, now we'll move on to the balance of the agenda of which I will recommend time short of any concerns or comments and we'll move into the new list of legislation. And the first item is number three, I believe. This is approving sale of certain city-owned land located in the Hickory Urban Development Renewal Area to Cascade Valley. Anyone here wish to speak on this? Yes, sir. Very good. Is there questions or comments? Uh, Mr. Swirsky and then Ms. Mobian. Um, 
Mr. Swirsky, could you please turn on your mic? Thank you. Sorry, Bob. <laughs> not bother me. We need it for the record. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, it started in 2002, um, and you refer to new developers poised to complete the project in, in conformity with the conditional zoning designation. Could you explain that a little bit? Well, this, yeah, this was, uh, this was originally approved in 2002 for the for this development at a slightly higher density than what is is right. proposed now. Since then, roads were built, the city built roads, and a, and a couple houses were built, so that conditional use was initiated, and so now we're here to with an RFP right. no, to solve. Right, understand the history, but what is the conditional? I'm sorry, my question is about the conditional zoning designation. Yes, it's for the for the the development itself in terms of the lot sizes essentially and that right. density. Are there some specifics to that? Is that just the sizes, the size of the property? Are you referring to the previous conditional use? Yeah. You said you're gonna follow those, but I don't what are they? I don't have them in front of me, but we can provide that to council. That would be great. They would cover Okay, that'd be great to provide it to us. Yeah. Mr. Morgan. So we're talking about 40, is it 40? 41, I believe. Excuse me. 41. New property. The, 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 the proposal, I'm oh, sorry, the proposal is for 54 new constructed, that is uh, 27, uh, 27 um, townhomes and 27 single family detached. So right now there are about 40, actually 43 lots, but those, some of those will be divided and some of those will be used for, again, for the 54 that's going to be proposed at this time. Now, how many specs are there? Because I know they've had some specs up for a while. Of the specs, spec, like in the spec homes, or yeah. are you talking about? The spec I'll, I'll just bring up the, um, okay. uh, the developers here. And I just want to know about if there are going to be any spec, um, um, which I don't. Yes, know. i tell you what. Well, uh, if you could please, I'm sorry, excuse me. I will ask them to come forward, oh, if I'm you sorry. don't mind. Uh, please, if you wouldn't mind coming forward, uh, and please provide for us your name and address. We appreciate it and the, the reason why you're here. Thank you very much. Good, good afternoon. My name is Keith Mitchell with Ryan Homes, 6770 West Snowville Road, Brexville, Ohio. I'm here with the rest of the team, Doug Jones and Emily Ketcher of Ryan Homes, as well as Scott Bennett, the developer, as well as John Walsh, our engineer. So we Thank have you. a whole plethora of people to ask questions. Very good. Thank so you. Desire. Can just um, make it brief, please. We're, yeah, we're, this is, um, we're continuing the, the development. It's 54 total lots in there. We're going to build 27 townhomes and 25 single family development. Their, their single family homes will be ranch homes, 1,400 square foot to about 1,900 square foot. The townhomes will be right around 1,650 square feet. Everything's going to be front load garage. We're utilizing the existing pavement that's in there. We're just doing two additional stubs heading towards Memorial, if you're familiar with the project. Um, we're using all the infrastructures there, minor modifications to accommodate the new product we're putting in there as opposed to the previous product that was introduced there. Um, that's pretty much it. Very good. Questions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mobian, do you have yes. any further questions yes, that we'd like one. to ask? Could someone provide for us this evening? We're, we have like five or six or four or five new developments that are coming up. Could someone pull that together for us? Because you're talking about Diagonal Road, Mall Avenue, um, now Hickory uh, Avenue. There's another one somewhere I'm missing. South Hawkins. South Hawkins. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, just a list or a, yeah, a map. Should we, we've yeah. got that. We can definitely provide Okay. That. Thank Very you. Good. Thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments from anyone? Very good. Mr. Swarsky? I just, um, I mean, I applaud this project. I'm just, what consideration has been made uh, to the fact that there's going to be, well, not a large number, but sizable number of new homes, new activity in this area, which is welcome. But um, we, some of us already have been concerned about the traffic flow on Memorial Parkway. 
the speed, speeding. I'm wondering, is there going to be a traffic assessment? What what steps will the city be taking? Yeah, I, I can address that. So um, one thing we are eager, you know, about the opportunity to sell this land because it, as council recognizes, as mentioned, this, this infrastructure was put in years ago. So the administration would like to see. Um, Mr. Segeti, could you turn your mic on, please? Oh, thank you. You're on. Um, and part of that, we'll look at the traffic patterns of this new development. I, I think probably the one turning movement that if there would be anything that would be problematic would be cars coming north on Hickory and turning left onto Memorial Parkway. That's something we can have the traffic engineer look at. I will tell you that warranting traffic signals at an intersection like that can be tough because we've got a hill. Um, sometimes putting in a signal will cause more rear-end collisions, but that's all, all things that the traffic engineer would look at, and probably most likely we need to look at after the development is built and traffic patterns to be analyzed. But I can tell you too, 54 housing unit, it's not generating an extreme amount of traffic. So Good. Uh, I, I would think that those intersections can accommodate that, but we would definitely take a closer look with trained personnel to determine that. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Segeti. Is there uh, any further comments? Mr. Neal. Just a quick question. In regards to the initial, when the lots were first sold, is the price per lot still around the same? I mean, are we recouping the, the infrastructure, uh, uh, cost of infrastructure we put in that area? No, the, uh, the, the, the sales price is $400,000. Um, that's based on a request for a proposal. So um, the the price, there is a difference in the price, and the price is obviously less in this case. We're selling the properties um, as is. So, the, uh, so there is a lesser cost. So there, the infrastructure and all that, that can be sold, can, it will be part of that. Very good. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, I just want to make sure I, I, I caught you, Mr. Westcott. So we're selling the property. Since we put the infrastructure in there, are we selling it? As, as improved property, meaning we're recouping that cost, or are we selling it at a, at a loss? I, I, can, I can address that. I mean, it will help to praise potentially some of that cost. I think the balance that we're trying to strike with selling this land is we need to sell it for a price that it makes it feasible for the homes to be constructed. Um, otherwise, the revenue would be zero. There would right. be no homes, so we would recoup nothing for the if, uh, infrastructure. If we could get just a number on what what that is because this is going to fall on that 15 year 100 percent tax abatement so it will okay thank you <coughs> thank you very much for the questions or comments is there a recommendation well i'd like us to look at this uh, carefully and just take a week's time okay okay there's a motion to refer this item is there a second yes. all those in favor of referring this item signify by saying aye, aye. against the ayes have it Four is approving sale of certain vacant city-owned land at uh, East Exchange Street pursuant to the Economic Development Land Banking Program. Yeah, this is a sale of the land for the, the dumpsters, uh, budget dumpsters there at Fountain Street and Exchange Street that we talked about, so we had the conditional use. This is the actual sale of that land for that project. Okay, very good. Questions or comments? Is this, as the sale price I see, is what, what was the, What's, what, why is it what it is? 92,000. Mr. Yeah, so, yeah. Mr. Uh, Westcott. Westcott. <laughs> no, I know who you are. Just, <laughs> I'm just recognizing you as the chair of the committee. The uh, yeah, sell price is what we uh, negotiated with the, uh, with, with the potential purchasers. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Westcott. Further questions or comments? What's the recommendation? Is there a um, recommendation on this item? Consent agenda okay? Sam will Say work. consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. The ayes have it. Number five, approving the sale of certain vacant city owned property located between Pitkin and Dayton Street pursuant to the land banking project. Ah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This would be the sale of land. It is known as the old former Harris School. Uh, this would be sold to a developer for 12 new single family homes. Um, and we have the developer here if you have any questions. Very good, thank you. For the questions or comments, Ms. Mobian. 
Now, I, I have driven down Pickin. Are we talking about what is currently called a park? Is there was It's is there, uh, empty field with grass. I mean, there's. The site of the former Harris Elementary School. I'm trying my best to, because I turned on from Cargo Falls Avenue. It'd be north. And I turned right, going towards State Street, that is. And on the left hand side, unless I went the wrong way, because it, it only goes one way, right? Picking off Cargo Falls. Does it go across Cargo Falls Avenue? It what does. The base, you can ask the question what the base is. Mr. Kilby, did you have a comment? Yeah. No, okay. Well, if you could uh, speak it no, to no, the no, microphone. No, 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 well, please. I, I, I can go back, because I thought I saw the space, but I'm not sure. Okay, I'll go back. But furthermore, I, I was here for the hearing during the commissioner's um, review of this, and there are some other parts to this project. Apparently, some people have already secured loans for some of the homes that are being built, are being proposed. I, I'm not aware of that. There was something that was discussed Mr. at Westcott? the Planning Commissioners. Uh, yeah, at the Planning Commission was just um, the potential developer is um, trying to uh, get the properties and the product together and working with the neighbors to order to for the sales or people who are interested in the property. So that's what they're uh, that's what their developer, potential developer, is doing at this point. And it sounds like Huntington Bank or someone is already. Is so somebody, uh, I mean, it was talked about at the. The, uh, uh, at the, the initial conversation was that they were working with Huntington Bank to okay. work with the, the 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 potential purchasers in order for financing. Right, and we're talking about homes in the price range of. The the homes at this point is in the price range of about one hundred and eighty thousand dollars. In this, in this particular neighborhood, and that was the, the question that was raised. Is there anyone to here to speak to this? Or? Uh, there is a developer here, uh, uh, Grassy Homes representative, so. Are they here? Uh, if you'd like to come forward, sir, uh, if you could please provide for the committee your name and um, address. Uh, my name is Tony Crassy, Crassy Homes, 1212 Portage Trail, uh, Cuyahoga Falls. Um, it's a very good question. It's what sinks most of these infill projects. And I think this is a little snapshot in time, quite literally. We have Huntington Bank willing to come forward. We've got families that want to do this. We have a, a property that is easy to build on. And I, I had challenged the families. I, I gave this about a 2% chance of ever happening six months ago. Here we are, and we've got families that are getting pre-approved right now, and thus your question, which shocked me, to be honest with you, to be very honest with you. But people are getting pre-approved, 170 to 180, and right now we, we you think we have six or seven people ready to go through final closing. Not closing, but the formal process. Um, and so it's happening. Good. That's great news. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is, but if you drive down Pickens, the average home on Pickens is what? Maybe sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000. Yeah. And what we're hoping to do in the bigger picture of things is try to rebuild the neighborhood. And I know that's the goal of, the, of Akron as well. And it is challenging to do a market rate project anywhere in this country without some type of uh, federal subsidies. And here we have something, blue collar, market rate, and it looks like it's happening. And like I said, this is a snapshot in time. It just great. happens to happen right now. It's very good news. And obviously those acquisition or those contracts are subject to approval from the city of Akron for, you know, the uh, sale of the property, obviously, and other items, I assume. Uh, when you say, Mr. Fusco. Yeah, it would be subject to approval from the city of Akron to sell the property to the developer. Obviously, correct. those contracts would That's say that. That's correct. So they're, okay, Mr. Segedy had a comment? Yeah, I, I just wanted to add for uh, planning committee that if you recall when we did the planning to grow Akron before we found that a couple of years ago there were 500 houses torn down in the city and 10 built. And I think when you look, you know, quite honestly, we're not used to new houses being built in Akron. $180,000 for a new house is an extremely reasonable price. Um, and we're, you know, if you compare, if you're kind of comparing apples to oranges if you just look at the houses on Pitkin because many of them are 100 years old or close to it. So um, I think those of us that own older houses in Akron, and I just spent $6,000 on getting poles put in my basement. Um, you know, there's a lot of maintenance that goes with an older house. So I think when you look at what you get for that money, 
Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Any further quest questions or comments? No, if you have, folks sit around and buy them. Bye. Okay. Very good. Uh, Ms. Samples? Thank you, Mr. Chair. This question is for Abe. So when I look at for um, the legislation um, Chairman Fusco read on four, and then I look at five, on the valuation, for 1.869 acres, it was 88,000. And now we're on 1.058 acres, it was 92,000. Where are we getting the valuations from? Uh, Mr. This Westcott. One, oh, sorry, this one is um, based on the rate per rate that is that the Akron Public Schools, we gave us a, an appraisal of that property. So we just prorated it, basically carved out carved out that the the size of those lots so that was the uh that was the price on that that property over there off of uh, harris okay okay thank you thank you mr kilby thank you mr chairman uh yeah this is my ward uh it sounds like pretty good development uh if uh how, what square footage are these houses going to be these are around 1500 square feet 15 to 1600 square feet Two stories, single family detached, detached garages. Are they going to have uh, front porches, like try to make them look like the houses that are already there? Yes, sir, they are. Yes, sir, they are. We photographed just about every home up and down the streets. Okay. Good. And I had mentioned this before in planning, is I have a degree in yeah. architecture, so. Yeah, this will be a real addition this to is the what neighborhood. We're doing. Uh, you said the prices are going to be like 170000 170 to 180 Yeah. Just, uh, <laughs> I don't know, people want to buy them. Uh, it just seems like a little high for Akron, but if you say, uh, you sound like you know what you're doing if you already got three approved uh, loans. That's the key that's, to this. That's great, it'll just pick up the uh, property value of everybody else around there. So, thank you. Very good, thank you. Thank you all for all your comments. Again, this is, I think, it's obvious this is um, a result of the, uh, the, the tax abatement program. And in terms of the market and where the market's at today, uh, I believe we're in a great position to see more and more new housing, which uh, of course is bringing in uh, new families and new folks. So that's, that's ex very exciting. Mr. Neal. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I, I think one, is, one of the things that's being revealed to us for those of us that live here is that um, we need to get out a little bit and understand how blessed we are to have cheap housing prices here. Um, but as Mr. Segedy said, uh, you know, new homes, they cost. My concern is this, um, knowing what new development has, has done in other communities, the, the, the challenge whenever you bring in new property values and they start to increase. And I know we're a ways from this, but I, I want us to keep this on the radar. What uh, could be the potential impact to these communities where people are used to the cheap home prices and they're struggling to keep up with their property taxes at the rate that they are right now. I want us to have something in the, in our, in our um, projections to address that issue because when I look at the number of properties that uh, I'll say in my world, that are behind on property taxes, it's alarming. It is very alarming. So as we bring in new development and it starts to push up these property values, if things don't change, because most of these homes now are seniors, people that are retired on fixed incomes, um, or if we don't push up the, the median income within our community, this is going to be a challenge that we're going to have to, you know, it, it's the, it's the, curse that comes with the blessing, so to speak. So I, I would like for us to see some type of projection because what comes to mind is a while back when we were putting all that development downtown for student housing. And I remember Mr. Moby and asked at that time, well, have we reached our capacity? And we saw that one development, I don't know if it was because of mismanagement or because of, you know, the projections were off because when everybody was looking when the University of Akron had 30,000, now they're down 10,000 and you got all this student housing and it starts to create this, this dynamic. So I want us to be, to have the foresight to look at, you know, how are we gonna balance this? Um, are we gonna offer some kind of special, like legacy um, tax abatement for folks who have been here for a while as property values start to creep up? But if, if, if council members take a look at their wards and see the number of properties that are 
are behind on property tax would be very alarming. So I just want us to, to keep that. Thank you. Very good. Thank you for bringing that up. Is there further questions or comments? Hearing none, what's the wishes? Consent agenda okay? Okay, good. Is there a recommendation for consent? So moved. Second. 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 All those in favor signify by saying aye. Got it. just a few more items left here. Uh, six is approving the donation of certain vacant city-owned property from the land banking project to Summit County Land Reutilization Corporation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Committee members, we should be donating a vacant lot over to the Summit County Land Bank. We don't have a public need for it. We would uh, uh, donate it over to them. It would save us maintenance costs. Um, it's something that's just been, we've had for since like 1994. Perfect, thank you. Is consent agenda okay on That'd this? That'd be fine. Questions or comments? Hearing none is a recommendation for consent. Is there, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Uh, Ayes have it. Seven, approving the sale of certain vacant city owned property at 986 Leroy Street pursuant to the land reutilization program. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This would be our standard side yard sale. It would go to the abutting owner at our standard price. Perfect, consent agenda okay? That'd be fine. Questions or comments? A recommendation for consent. All those in favor signify by saying aye. The aye. ayes have it. Eight, approving the, the donation of certain city owned property located at 411 Ira Avenue to the Summit County Metro Parks pursuant to the land banking project. Mr. Hardy. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, both eight and nine, not to get ahead of ourselves, are uh, relating to the pump house project at Summit Lake. Um, as many of you have read and probably know over the past year, Summit Metro Parks has been an incredible partner on uh, Akron Civic Commons. Um, Nick Moskis is here, who is the planning director of Summit Metro Parks, to answer any of your questions. But um, safe to say that uh, Metro Parks hopes to establish a permanent um, presence at Summit Lake and return this asset uh, into a performing asset for the community. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Hardy. Questions, comments? Consent agenda okay? Yes, please. Okay, uh, is there a recommendation for consent? So, second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. The aye set. Absolutely. Did you hear that, Mr. Uh, Clerk, Mr. Keith? Ms. Sims would like her name added to item number eight. Ms. Sims? Yes. Okay. And nine as well? All right. And nine as well. And nine as well, thank you. Uh, so item number nine, um, just to, to be formal here, uh, approving the donation of certain city-owned property located on Ira Avenue to the Summit County Metro Parks pursuant to the land reutilization program. Read that into the uh, record. Uh, is there any questions or comments? Uh, I assume the consent is okay. Mr. Neal. Uh, just want to ask, I, I'm sure there's some kind of supporting documentation. It's not in our, it's not our thing. We can just have the supporting documentation added, that's all. We'll get that for you this evening. Okay, thank if, you. If so it's okay. not there, yep. Very good, is a recommendation, thank you. Uh, for a consent agenda? So moved. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. The ayes have it. Very good. Okay, 9A, this is, this is kind of a long one. Declaring a certain improvements to real property located in the amended <coughs> airport development area to be a public purpose and exempt from real property ta taxation, providing for the collection of service payments in lieu of taxes and the deposit of those service payments in the appropriate fund, providing for the payment of a portion of the service payments to the Akron Public Schools District. Mr. Yes, Becker. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, this is for, um, so we can file our uh, tax increment financing application with the state. This is for the Teakin project out at the airport which you all know that is a completed project now, so we're able to file the TIF application where we have done some public improvements as well as the project um, is going to use some of this tax increment financing. And consent agenda would be fine. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Becker. It's been, I know Mr. Hope isn't here, but we've been watching that uh, come out of the ground and it's a, it's, it's a, it's a really cool building and um, I know what they do in there is, uh, is uh, very positive for the airport. Yes. Uh, very good. So, uh, questions or comments? Is there a recommendation for consent? Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Ayes have it. 9B, declaring a s certain improvements to real property located in the Firestone North Urban re Renewal Area to be a public purpose and exempt from real property taxation, providing for the collection of service payments in lieu of taxes and the deposit of those.
those service payments in the appropriate fund, providing for the payment of a portion of the service payments to the Akron Public Schools. Mr. Becker. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, again, this is for our tax increment financing application. This is for the Triangle Building in Firestone, Firestone area, where we know Summit County is now occupying that building. And now we have the opportunity to follow this with the state and be able to utilize um, the tax coming from that Great. real estate tax. Thank you, sir. Any questions or comments? Consent okay? Please. Okay. Motion for consent. Second. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. The ayes have it. Thank you very much. Uh, we're adjourned. Thank you all for your patience. Get used to it. Public service, please.
what time is it? Oh, our clock's not working. Not sure. Oh. It's not hmm? messed up. I know. It's been messed up since you've been gone. Oh, really? I got to get up there with a stick, set the time. Because it went during one meeting, the second hand fell on my shoulder. <laughs> and it Fusco's giving me eyeballs like it's my fault. <laughs> you see him when you look at me and look at the clock. Look at that guy. Madam Chair, whenever you're ready. Excuse my French. Came or bus call. I'd like to call the public service meeting to order. All members of the committee are present. Is there a motion on the minutes from our previous meeting? I have a motion and I have a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Okay, hearing and seeing none, the motion to approve the minutes has passed. And now we will go into our first, uh, oh, with our old agenda, we have nothing on our old agenda to come before us, so we will go right into what we have new on the agenda. And our first piece before public service is, why am I missing this? Ordinance authorizing the director of public service or his designee to enter into forestry management related agreements affecting the Upper Cauga River watershed, authorizing payment therefore and declaring an emergency. Mr. Madam Warren. Chairwoman, members of the committee, this ordinance would, would uh, accept our water management plan. Um, I know last week, I think it was Thursday or Friday, we sent you the entire plan. Uh, we also put copies in your box. Hopefully you had an opportunity to review it. I know that we also did a few tours up there to let you see what has occurred up there in the recent past. Um, I'm going to let Jeff and Jessica do a little longer explanation of what's going on here, but I'll refer to them. Okay. Mr. Thank you, Jeff, Madam Mr. Chairwoman. Jeff Bernowski. Members of the committee, my name is Jeff Bernowski. I'm responsible for drinking water supply operations for the city of Akron. And uh, one thing that we're extremely proud of is that we're an award-winning drinking water utility. And a big reason why we're award-winning is because of our watershed management program that we have. Um, one thing that, that makes it very difficult to run a watershed management program is the fact that there are a multitude of activities that go on to ensure that the drinking water of the city of Akron is of the utmost quality as well as affordable. And that's something that we believe we clearly are. Um, in order to run a watershed management program, you need funds to ultimately um, do activities to essentially provide that the raw water qualities in the lake is optimal. And one thing that we found um, was based on a pilot project that we did just back in July is that we have an opportunity and what that pilot project was was 
we um, performed forest management on about 40 acres of property. And that forest management essentially allowed the removal of trees, and it was only a small number of trees, 10 trees per acre for about 400 total trees over 40 acres. Um, but it, what it did was it removed those trees that um, were, were essentially near uh, their age, near falling, as well as several others with the intent of allowing light to penetrate down onto, onto the uh, forest bottom, onto the ground, to essentially allow additional trees to grow. And this project ultimately um, was proven to be successful. And we have, I have my colleague here, Jessica, as well as a member of ODNR who manages programs like these. But ultimately, what we found is, is that this project was successful and will allow us to continue to perform additional uh, forest management type programs as well as other environmental management type programs without having to come to council to request additional funds. We can reinvest those funds right back into the watershed itself. So it, it was a successful project and this legislation is essentially to allow us to do 120 acres per year for a total of three years, which is only, we have 11,000 acres in the watershed um, that essentially are available for management in the future, but we're not at all asking for that. We're simply asking for a very small percentage of the total to, to continue to confirm that this is a program that we would like to continue to invest in, so. Jessica. Thank you so much. Jessica? Thank you, committee. Um, oops, sorry, it has a mind of its own today. A you might bit. have to hold it. It's just for the recordings that we get this all recorded. Sure. Um, uh, really, not much more to build off of what Jeff had already said, but you know, we feel that the pilot that we were allowed to do earlier this summer was um, highly successful. We've had some other um, organizations and agencies come out to our site to look at um, what happened and uh, have thus, they, they are moving forward with programs similar to this um, for their own uh, organizations. So, you know, um, it's not just us saying that we think it's successful, but, you know, we do have uh, members of the public as well who agree that what we've done is, is a good example of forest management. Thank you. I was just gonna say, Madam Chair, that uh, John Keene is that pronunciation John. is here in the audience if you have questions of the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. I, I think since he's here that possibly we should hear from him. I think um, it would probably be good. Yes, my name is John Keene. I'm an ODNR district manager. I've been a service forester and a forester for almost 20 years with them. Um, one of our goals is to assist private landowners and also, and you guys are considered private landowners, to do uh, proper forest management to meet the goals of the landowner and uh, that is exactly what we've been working on for the past three years um, with the city of Akron. This is the first uh, real management they've done and to my knowledge in quite a few years. So uh, we have lots of privately owned forest land in the northeast part of Ohio and the vast majority of it is grossly mismanaged. So using a, uh, a site like this, um, I've already used it to uh, train other natural resource professionals who have uh, a wide range of views on, on how to manage forests, but uh, it, it's proving to be, proven to be a very successful site. I think it's a, a smart program that uh, the watershed um, has gotten themselves involved in and th they have opportunities throughout their lands. And it's not all just commercial sales. There's a lot of stuff that they could do that are pre-commercial that they could invest in to really greatly improve the watershed. And we are here as basically an oversight to make sure that these things get done as well as can be done. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, did anyone, before you sit down, Mr. Keeney, if anyone from the committee has any questions for you. Mr. Keeney. Go ahead, Councilman Fusco. Not really, just a, not so much of a uh, question, but just a comment. Um, I know 
we uh, we took a real met you Friday, uh, Mr. Hogan. I went, took a drive up there. Uh, took a ride up there, I should say, and um, just appreciate your passion in terms of, you know, because it came through quite a bit in terms of us working with you and, you know, in, in terms of developing a strategy that's going to, you know, be beneficial in terms of our asset. And that is, I mean, as we talked about on Friday, you know, aside from our personnel, our people, the people who do the work, you know, probably up there is one of our greatest assets here in the city of Akron. And, you know, develop a strategy and a plan, a management plan, uh, makes a heck of a lot of sense. And, and what you had, had, had told us um, made a lot of sense as well. And, and, and I kind of uh, applaud those efforts. Um, and it's good, to, it's refreshing to see ODNR uh, working with the city of Akron on, on this particular item and kind of supporting us on this. Uh, it just makes a lot of sense uh, to me. So thank you for that. You're very welcome. Thanks. These guys have been great to work with. Anybody else? Uh, Bruce, you're not on the committee. Let me make sure no one else, any, any questions? Okay. Uh, Councilman Kilby. Well, thank you, Madam uh, Chairman. So how many trees did you say we took out uh, last this summer, uh, 40? 400 or? 400. Okay. 440 trees. Four, over the, how, uh, how many acres was that on? 40 acres. Okay. So, uh, what were they? Mostly uh, old uh, hardwood trees like oaks and maples and things like that? Oh, I'll defer to Jessica. Thank you. Um, so, it's, it's kind of a mix. Um, we, I'm compiling uh, the list uh, that will be available that goes through um, how many of each different type of species was removed from the um, property. Um, it wasn't necessarily based on like, well, you know, we want all the biggest trees or we want all of, you know, we were trying to um, look at it as a managed and balanced approach. Uh, we used this opportunity to get rid of um, some diseased trees or damaged trees, um, trees that might contaminate others um, with disease that we know are moving through these areas. Um, as well as some of the trees that have kind of reached their, their peak and are going to begin to um, possibly fall, damage other trees, or um, potentially, you know, I'm sorry. Yeah, but yes, for, for safety issues too, uh, this parcel is used for, um, it has public access through the ODNR for mostly passive recreation, but there is public yeah. hunting on this property. So were any of them uh, ash trees? I know they're all dying. Yes, we, we took ash and elm, um, and we also... Oh, they were already sorry. dead, probably? Um, the, the, if we did take, I know that um, we had some of the dead ones cut. Those, those don't kind of count um, towards yeah. what we had. They, they still lay there. Um, most of those were for safety reasons. We did take live ash, live elm, live beech, yeah. um, trees that we know uh, are prone to these diseases. Um, we did not take all of them, but we definitely thinned areas to help not have disease spread so quickly. Okay, so was there any uh, commercial value to this wood? Did we get any money for this wood? I mean, the maple, and I'm sure the oak was worth something. Yes, um, but it's not really, like, we weren't necessarily doing this to make the money. Um, you know, a lot of it, we ended up spending on you know time and, and personnel and, and things okay. like that um, so how much did we get um the final total how much money did we get for the timber did, did you know how much or i i don't have the number exactly off the top of my head i wouldn't want to misquote it i'm sorry okay so the uh one of the things that uh, they've always talked about with the watershed is a problem with i think is the term is turbidity dirt in the water. I mean, by doing this in the middle of summer, didn't that stir up a lot of dirt that got washed into, this by Ledoux, right? Mm -hmm. Didn't that cause some extra turbidity to be, wouldn't it have been better to do this in the winter time? So um, the, the time, and, and you know, perhaps John uh, Keene could answer this a little bit better because he did help um, us guide, this, uh, guide us through this process. Um, but we, we didn't really see turbidity. We, we had an um, approach where, you know, we're not taking out large amounts of trees that are yeah. freeing up soils. Um, we had restrictions as well on what kind of equipment 
that the loggers could use okay. um, to keep the soils intact, you know, and we, we limited the amount of heavy equipment, Good. just okay. the one thing. So you guys thought everything there, huh? Well, I mean, we tried to cover Good. everything because, you know, I understand. We, this is important to us. All right, I understand. You guys are doing a good job. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of council? Councilman Neal? Um, just a quick question. I, I remember last time this came before us, we had some um, neighbors to that property that came with a lot of questions, a lot of suggestions. All those were addressed. We, we, we didn't just ignore those, I'm sure. Yeah, I, I would just say we had a lot of contact with people in Geauga County because I think in the past there have been uh, logging operations in Geauga County that were just clear cut and they were concerned that we were gonna do a similar thing. Well, what we've done is something absolutely special and we've done it where we've removed, like she said, just the diseased trees, the trees that we know are gonna that be dying in the next few years, they're gonna come down anyway, and we removed them in a way that uh, we didn't take the stumps out, we, we used the, the time of the year, the amount of the uh, kind of equipment that was used, and those kinds of things to try and minimize the disruption to the area. So I think after we were done, I won't speak for Geauga County, but I think they probably were impressed as to how we actually did this tree removal. Okay, well thank you. I remember the other thing they were trying to get us to understand was that there was Mr. Swirsky, I don't know if you remember this, because they, they said that there was a way that we could earn, I want to say, was it carbon credits? Some type of credits for having the trees there? Are we capitalizing on that? Thank you, I can speak to that. Um, we are looking into carbon credits. Um, we haven't, um, we've done a little bit of investigation on that. We uh, visited a site that is a water supply that does do carbon credits um, to kind of get an understanding of what that program would look like. Um, and basically the findings that we brought, came back with is that you can have active forestry management programs on parcels that are enrolled in carbon credit uh, programs as well. Um, so, you know, we're still kind of investigating what that might look like for Akron. Um, it's kind of complicated, so there's, there's a lot to learn still for us, but it is something we're still looking into and um, would not necessarily impact our forestry management, but might complement that. Um, let me go to Mr. Hoke, who's on the committee who hasn't spoken yet. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just wanted to say thank you uh, for uh, setting this up, and, and, uh, and it was time well spent going up to, uh, to Ladue. Uh, had never been up there before, and uh, uh, pretty impressive as to uh, the land that's up there and uh, the, uh, the size of the reservoir that we've seen and, uh, you know, how much is involved in, uh, you know, it was, it was more than just a ride up and a ride back, you know, a, a lot of discussion on the way and uh, as we got there and, and uh, John Keene and, and uh, Dan, uh, the uh, uh, consultant, uh, and, um, and uh, the three of you that were there, Mark included. Uh, and it, it was uh, very enlightening, very, uh, uh, very nice to know. It, it's a, it's a, a huge science that goes on as to, uh, you know, what and how we get out of our spigots. It, it, and and uh, I know that uh, most people don't even understand or probably don't care. All they want to do is, uh, you know, go, go to the sink and turn, turn the faucet and, and the water's supposed to be there. But uh, it's, it's got to be there safely and, 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 uh, and uh, we appreciate that. Uh, uh, like I said, it was, uh, it was time well spent. It was uh, uh, very enlightening and uh, I appreciate uh, the, the time that you took and getting us back and forth and, and uh, you know, discussing everything with us and, and uh, 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 I know that uh, um, with everything that was talked about with uh, John you know, and, you know, standing out in the middle of the forest and, and uh, I know that you're talking about, uh, you know, getting dirt into uh, the reservoir and everything else and, and uh, uh, the explanation of the barriers that are built there and uh, to kind of uh, uh, keep the, the rushing water from, you know, uh, you know, taking all the soil with it as it's going into the reservoir and, uh, and everything. Uh, that's, that's nice to know and, and uh, 
the uh, the treetops that are left and for for the environment and for the uh, the uh, animals and everything that are out there I, there is so much that goes on there and, and so much to learn about it and, and uh, it was uh, it was very very nice and and I just wanted to thank you all for that and, and John and Chris for you know making sure that this happened also thank you thank you madam chair yes Councilman Kilby. Thank you, Madam Chair. <coughs> Does anybody know how many acres Akron owns in Geauga County? How many acres approximately or whatever? I don't have the approximate number off the top of my head. Uh, we own, um, in, the, in Geauga County, in the upper Cuyahoga River, we own about 33% of the land in Geauga County. Okay. So, so that's not the entire county, but it, in the upper Cuyahoga River that we yeah, manage. So we'd there. own uh, probably the, be the biggest landowner in the county. We are Geauga the county. biggest landowner in Geauga so, County. I know I'm familiar with this area. Uh, you own a lot of land, uh, East Branch, way up there north of Chardon, and uh, I think Reservoir, I mean, Ladue's much bigger, but uh, all along there, Burton Station Road, we own land. Uh, my grandfather had a farm up there, and he rented land from the city of Akron in the 1920s. So, I mean, so I'm familiar with this area, and uh, you know, when they built the reservoir, it was all strictly farms now. It's, if you, as you know, it's been built up. I mean, do they, like the, you know, these houses that are around uh, Ladue, do they have a sewage system or are they septic? Are they on septics or what? Uh, yes, most of the communities, um, with the exception of like the village of um, Mi Middlefield, Burton, um, they have water systems, but most of these homes that are around Ladue, around East Branch Auburn are all- Township and all that? There, I, I believe, yeah, Auburn Township and um, yeah. kind of the surrounding areas there, they're all um, mostly septic systems. There are a few little pockets, like there's a um, mobile home park and some associated that's next to Ladue that does have a, a wastewater plant. Okay. Um, so it just depends on the area, but you know, it's, it's probably over 60% is just uh, right. septic. So is that a problem that there's septic systems up there close to our watershed? Is that something we have to watch? Yeah, that, that can be a problem. That one's a little more challenging because you can't necessarily see if a septic system is failing. Um, you know, we, we do work with the health departments in both Portage and Geauga County to try and monitor um, septic system upgrades and installs and you know we do try if we can find a discharge um, that maybe would uh, express a failing septic system there. So do we have the authority to order them to do something about it or is that up to Chaga County? Uh, we don't have the authority. Um, we, we're kind of watchdogs so when, when we see something like that we have a good relationship with Geauga Health Department um, that we can contact them and okay. you know they'll send out an investigator. So has that happened recently? Um, it happens occasionally. It hasn't happened in the last few um, months. Generally, it's a lot easier to detect these things on the rivers or um, on the actual shoreline of the reservoir. Um, but we've been pretty lucky in the last couple of months at least. Thank you. And I'll just add, we've been pretty aggressive too in our land acquisition. You remember last year we came before you to purchase the trailer park and we completed that purchase. And you know, we do that. We look for those things all the time. Councilman Fosco. Oh, I apologize, Mr. Spursky. Councilman Spursky. Yeah, uh, thank you for that tour. Uh, we thoroughly enjoyed it uh, last Saturday night. And I also really appreciate it. Rich, turn that mic on for me, please. Thank you. I, have, I also appreciate all the work that went into this manual um, and the, uh, the interest that you have in protecting the environment and your dedication to that. Um, Explain to me a little bit about why trees are important uh, in the battle against uh, climate change. Why are trees important? Uh, so that's a little larger than the um, scope, but that, that we are bringing here. Um, obviously, you know, trees are important. Nature is important for climate change as far as um, you know, carbon dioxide emissions and things like that. But I really um, don't. I'm not prepared to fully answer that question at this point. That is not being considered in this proposal at all, climate change. This is a city that uh, the mayor's office and the city council have passed resolutions uh, criticizing President Trump for uh, saying that climate change wasn't real. And I was just hoping that 
climate change would be part of consideration in your strategy in forestry, but you're, nobody here could tell me, is that? So the document that you have is mm -hmm. um, a training document for right. watershed employees. Um, you right. know, we consider uh, our program to be um, balanced. You know, we are trying to balance other land use and other things that happen with water quality, but ultimately our focus is water quality. Um, and, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that it discredits anything else that we do. You know, we do have, you know, like Jeff said, 11,000 acres of land that we manage, um, you know, within the Upper Cuyahoga River for a variety of different uses, but the majority of those lands are forested or are wetlands or are open water um, in some cases. So, you know, we do, I mean, all of those things would speak to, a, you know, helping the environment as opposed to, you know, if those lands were not by, owned by the city of Akron and they were allowed to be developed or something like that. Right, all those things are really important, um, but it's hard for me to, uh, to, uh, uh, separate out the, uh, the fact that climate change is such a threat um, not to our environment, but uh, many cities around the country are taking steps to to um, protect themselves from climate change, um, and many cities around the country have been asked to contribute to uh, the battle against uh, ignorance on climate change. I would just hope that this uh, this plan, as we move forward, that climate change be defined and be a cornerstone of how we handle all of our forests. Um, it, especially when we're talking about carbon credits, is there, is there a difference between small trees that have newly been planted in terms of dealing with climate change and big trees? That's the question I have. It seems like we're focusing on taking down big trees. Is, it, is there a difference? So we, we are not focusing necessarily on taking out big trees. You know, each um, parcel that we kind of look at it on, you know, they are all unique and they're all kind of custom, whatever forestry management um, planning that we would do. I don't necessarily think that it's fair to say that our plan ignores um, climate change. Uh, ultimately, we deal with environmental issues and just because we don't specifically mention climate change in our training manual, um, you know, we are investigating those carbon credits and uh, there is research that shows that you know, once a tree hits a certain age that it actually stops creating or stops pulling nutrients, stops um, using as much water and they kind of exist in that status quo. They've, they've reached their maximum potential, uh, so to speak. Whereas if you um, open the canopy to allow younger trees to come up in that, those younger trees will utilize more resources uh, and hold on to more of the nutrients, suck up more of the water so that it doesn't have that runoff but also as they're growing, uh, they do have the potential to sequester more carbon than a, an old tree necessarily the, the would do trees so. bigger than the uh, better. I'm sorry, can, what? Can absorb carbon better than the large trees? From, uh, from one of the uh, articles that I read, which I can yeah. share with you if you'd like. Um, sure. That is something that I had seen come recently out in uh, research. Um, I on the, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah, on, on the uh, question regarding climate change, you know, there are multiple initiatives within the water department as well as the wastewater department which are specifically in place to address the concerns of climate change. Um, there's been a host of new energy efficient type improvements that have been made, most specifically at the water plant with regards to new pumping systems, with new variable frequency drives, with right, the vehicles you guys should be drive. very proud of. And, and we are, we are. Mm -hmm. Um, but in, in regards to the forest management program, um, the, the initial uh, project that we did, the pilot project, was a small project to determine if indeed we could do a project like and get the drinking water quality benefits from it. And we found that to be true and all we're asking is for another small amount of forested land to once again prove that we could go down this road with thousands and thousands and thousands of acres of trees that will still remain for the purposes of climate change, for the purposes of possible carbon credits in the future and such. But it really, I mean, there are a multitude of issues involved there and we feel we do a great job of balancing all of the needs of 
um, not only the environment as a whole, but the needs of our, our customers and the water quality that we provide them. I want to add to that too. I just want to say that, you know, on Aqueduct Street, we took down, I think, 40 some trees. We replanted close to 150. Our CSO program for every tree we take down, we plant two. So as a city, we're conscious of what you're talking about. So it's not like the water department separate from the planning department, from the engineering. We're all in this together and we all realize the importance of this issue. And we do what we can throughout the city to make sure we address the issue. Thank you. Councilman Fusco? No? Okay. Anyone else on the committee? Yes. I'm sorry, I just also wanted to add, in addition to the trees that are planted through the city, um, the watershed division does plant between three and 4,000 trees in the watershed every year. Um, and we have been doing that for, uh, I think about the last five or six years. And I think it's listed, um, I, I know it's listed in the management program as well. Thank you. Um, I just have a couple before um, we end this, but um, is this a new practice, what we're doing now out there? Uh, no, I mean, actually, forest management goes back almost 100 years. I mean, on the books of the Akron Water Department are people that are, uh, our job descriptions with respect to forestry, forestry leaders, forestry supervisors, uh, forestry laborers. But um, it's been something for about 30 years now that essentially ha hasn't been performed due to cutbacks and such over the years. So we have, we have these, these, these timber stands that are essentially uh, are, are dying, all right, that are compromising water quality, are near dying. And so in lieu of having to hire a multitude of staff members within the water department, we felt that this, this is a great alternative to deal with that and look, you know, essentially do things that historically had been done for many, many years. So if I'm hearing this correctly, you believe it's in the best interest of our residents because of the quality of water that we will be enhancing by doing this. And it's also um, a cost effective way to address this need to maintain and to improve what we have. Would that be correct? That is correct. Okay. It, anything else from anyone else? Okay. Mr. Moore, what is your pleasure? We would prefer suspension of the rules because there are some grants that are becoming available first of the year that we would love to apply for to try and find additional funds to do more of the management of our watershed, but uh, okay. I'll put it to you. Okay. Uh, is there anyone who would like to make that motion? Okay. Is there a second on that motion? And I have a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing and seeing none. Okay, I think we have another piece here. We do. <coughs> Thank you. This one is 10A on your uh, agenda. It, it is an ordinance authorizing the Director of Public Service to enter into a right to use agreement between the City of Akron and the City of Fairhorn for the use of Akron owned fiber optic cable, finding that the subject fiber is not currently needed for municipal purposes and declaring an emergency. Mr. Hardy, Chief of Staff. Madam Chair, members of the committee, um, uh, myself, uh, Mr. Angeloni, and uh, Ms. Jessica Sublett, who is Chief Operating Officer for Bounce, are here to answer questions. Uh, what you have before you is the first step, uh, quite honestly, in, a, in what we hope is a, is a broader partnership between the City of Akron and the City of Fairlawn on the Fairlawn gig uh, utility that they've built out there. Um, this is a simple right to use agreement allowing the city of Fairlawn to connect to bounce physically through our uh, city owned conduit and very small, actually two fibers within a, uh, a 48 fiber strand of city owned fiber to bring 10 gigabit service to bounce. Um, that's what you have before you. And so uh, why is this important? Uh, Bounce, as you know, is a critical piece to the city, the county, and the chamber's new strategy around entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, we have been working with Bounce and the board for almost a year. Um, 
on how to relaunch the program that has existed going back to Roy Ray in some way, shape, or form. Um, the first floor, as many of you know, is currently under construction. The generator, as they call it, uh, will be an open um, innovation space with offices, co-working space, a cafe, and event space. It's very important that they have this level of internet for a space like that, otherwise all of us would be sitting there on our laptops not able to connect because too many people are trying to connect at the same time. So uh, this benefits a local municipality, our next door neighbor. It benefits the city and again, it's the first step in what we hope is a longer term um, relationship with the city of Farallon. So with that, happy to answer um, any questions you may have. Okay. I will open it up to the committee. Are there any questions from the committee? Any questions from members of council that are in the chamber? Councilwoman Sims. Thank you, Madam Chair. So is this a long-term contract or it just? Uh, actually, um, the way the agreement stated, uh, it would be the longer of however long Bounce would need to utilize the fiber or a period of three years. That basically mimics Bounce's agreement with Fairlawn Gig currently. They have a three-year agreement with them. So, Matthew T. Please. So is there an, any exchange of currency like between uh, Fairline G and Bounce, or how does that work? How do we, how are we paying for that? Yes. Uh, well, the city of Akron is not paying for for anything. Bounce is paying a monthly service fee directly to Fairlawn Gig. Okay. Bounce is a separate five hundred one c three. Okay. So, are we looking at um, Akron's gig? So to, so to build out a utility, a municipal utility on the scale of Fairlawn, it would be north of seventy million dollars. Um, I don't know that any of our budgets can handle something like that. And quite honestly, uh, we think that there could be a, a beautiful synergy between the city of Akron and the city of Fairlawn, much like we have done over the years with water and sewer. How can they extend their utility into the city and provide that service to Akron residents, much like any other utility? So that conversation is underway. We would have to bring back any sort of global agreement to this council. But yes, we think that the better route to bring Akron Gig would be to probably partner with Farallon Gig, as well as expand our horizons around other providers of internet service um, that may be interested in building out um, within the city. So I guess that kind of makes sense. So it sounds like a technology, technology jet, so to speak, if we, if we will. Uh, yeah, I think about it more, I mean, there would definitely need to be an agreement, but I think it's more along the lines of water agreements that the City of Akron has with, with partnering municipalities where we are extending a utility for purposes of providing that service, and in exchange we strike an agreement. We would be doing something similar with the City of Farallon because they treat the internet that they provide as a municipal utility, just water. And so it would be something like that would be... I so, guess. you know, we've talked a lot about the absence of access to technology all throughout the city. Mm -hmm. Are there any other fiber optics we might be able to access to bring greater uh, technological access to residents in the city? Yes, right now what's exacerbating the digital divide situation is that um, the, the big telecoms are becoming bigger and there is not as much choice as there once was even a decade ago. So that is, that is actually, quite honestly, offering an opportunity for more entrepreneurial companies to start to look at markets like Akron, Cleveland, and other cities across the country to build out their service um, where they might not be traditional internet service providers. Some cities like Fairlawn are deciding to make their own investment which we think we can leverage. So to answer your question, yes, I think Mayor Roth and Mayor Horgan have had specific conversations about what can be done about the digital divide and offering more low cost opportunity for broadband in areas of Akron that haven't traditionally had it. Those conversations are definitely a part of our negotiations with them. But we've also had it with every provider that has come to the city interested in, in offering service. What can you do and where will you be building as it relates to your service offerings. Because it's very critical to us that, that we get that most of these internet service providers wanna go where they're gonna get the highest what's called take rate. 
So they have to compete in the free market with all the other service providers, so they want downtown, they want where a lot of business is located. Um, when it comes to residential offerings, um, we have to be a little bit more, um, I would say, vigilant in working with these internet service providers to say where are you going to build out first, second, third, and so on. So I can tell you with Fairlawn Gig, they have been very, very receptive to that concern, Mayor Roth in particular. So I think that, um, quite honestly, it's always a lot easier to negotiate something with your neighbor than it is to try and negotiate something with a multinational corporation. So we think there's a lot of opportunity with Fairlawn Gig to try and get at the digital divide. Yeah, so my hope is, um, in, even in the planning stage, maybe figuring out some way how we incentivize that, because it seems like that deficit that we're talking about, just that chasm continues to grow, we're not really addressing it. So as we uh, continue our discussions and devise plans, maybe there's some way to incentivize those new folks who are coming into the city to do some of that work too, so we don't have such a chasm. Thank you. Councilman Neal. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Hardy, just uh, at, at some point, hopefully within the next few months, we've never really had a, a presentation to talk about, um, you know, we, at one time we were talking about like the 5G. Got it. Um, you yes. Know, the, the, the Akron plan to make us wireless, that's probably dead and gone, but, but let's look at, take a look at that to see what we can learn from that. Um, and just the, you know, as we talk about building our streets and all that, that blueprint, this whole smart city techno technology um, blueprint, we really don't have a, a plan that everybody understands and it's moved so fast. Love for us to have that opportunity to have, have that discussion so we can understand the asset that we have in our fiber that we're not really capitalizing on. We can learn how we failed with the, um, you know, the wireless component. Mm -hmm. And then even looking at, you know, we've got these buildings we call them community learning centers. Well, when they're done, is I mean, you know, for the communities that are around the community learning center, the rec center, the library, where they can tap in possibly to, uh, you know, their their um, wireless service when it's available, and then maybe we can incentivize these businesses that want tips and things from us if they can share their, you know, their, their wireless. So I mean, there's a lot of things that a lot of communities are doing. But if we don't talk about it, it's uh, so much out sure. there, we can't keep up with it. So we I'll can absolutely bring a presentation to council in the coming weeks, and I'll work with President Somerville, whichever committee she deems, we can, we can absolutely put that together. Okay, thank yep. you, sir. Thank you. Anyone else? What is your pleasure? So they are ready to flip the switch, actually, as they say. <laughs> so we would love to, no uh, yeah, right. we would love if the committee is willing uh, suspension of the rules. And additionally, um, and I've worked with Council uh, President Somerville, but um, Jessica is going to work to organize a tour for any council member who would like to come down, view the construction, get a sense of what bounce is and becoming. We'll work to put that I think together. That would be terrific. Thank you, Jessica, mm -hmm. for doing that for us. Okay, um, so am I hearing suspension of the rules? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, do I have a motion for suspension of the rules? Do I have a second? Yes. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing and seeing none, Jessica will be looking for that invite, so thank you so much. Is there anything else to come before this committee? Yes, Councilwoman Sims. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have a couple of items on the consent agenda. I believe that item seven and eight. Last week I asked for some information relative to uh, the cost of the loan long term, what the additions were, so on and so forth. I still have not gotten that information. So I don't know if they send it to you or? No, is this under public service? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, no, I did not get anything. Uh, excuse me, I, I can speak to it. I, I'll send you an email this afternoon. Uh, Heather from engineering, reach out to me. And so we have numbers that I can forward to you via email. Perfect. Okay. Does that answer your? Yes, that's good. Okay, anything else to come before the committee? And we are adjourned.
got to go back to my notes. Economic development will begin in just one minute, 60 seconds. With all members present, we'll begin the Economic Development Committee meeting. Can I get approval for our meeting minutes from December the 3rd? So, so approved. Can I get a second? Mr. Milkovich. Does it work? There you go. Can I get a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, we have uh, one old item to come before the committee. Um, the ordinance authorizing mayor to enter into a grant agreement with Beyond Expectation Barber College LLC in the amount of $32,500 for operating personnel, uh, personnel or other expenses in declaring an emergency. I know Councilwoman uh, Samples wanted to speak to that this, this afternoon. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I'm going to defer to uh, Mr. Hardy, but we will be pulling that piece of legislation um, based off of some things that have been done by the administration, so I'll defer to Mr. Hardy. Mr. Hardy. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Councilwoman Samples. Um, the administration had the opportunity, myself included, uh, to meet with Mr. Garrett and uh, Councilwoman Samples uh, this past week and talk about uh, what the need is. And there really is an opportunity for the city to support um, Beyond Expectations Barber College, in particular, to help students who have the skills but don't have the resources to pay for tuition uh, to get a jump start on a very honorable and lucrative profession. Um, we, the city, feel very comfortable based upon information that Mr. Garrett has shared with us, clean audits. Uh, we've spoken with his bookkeeper. Um, he is uh, definitely um, in a much better position financially than he was the last time he, he came to council. And we felt very strongly that since he has placed so many barbers and beauticians into our Great Streets program that he was a great uh, candidate for, um, for assistance through our, our small business assistance line on him, which is already in the consolidated plan that this council supported for the 2018 CDBG budget. So what we've put together is an initial forgivable loan of $15,000 uh, for uh, Beyond Expectations to be used to support student scholarships. Um, we will be working on a contract with Mr. Garrett to stipulate that uh, he share uh, his, continue to share his audits with the city, that they're clean, um, that he uh, use the dollars only to support um, students who need it, and that those students um, are on track and graduate. Uh, from this program, uh, and w we think it's a good opportunity. Mr. Garrett uh, believes he can support uh, three students uh, in the 2019 uh, academic year, and should everything work, which we don't anticipate that it wouldn't, he'd be eligible to come back to the city uh, for an additional forgivable loan. Again, forgivable based upon him meeting those obligations. If for any reason he is unable to, he would then owe the money back, which uh, helps take the risk further down for the city. So we thought it was a good opportunity. Uh, Mr. Garrett uh, seemed to think that that was gonna uh, really give him the support that he needed to, to get at least three students jump-started 
And so with that, um, we're happy to, uh, to be working with him. Thank you, Madam Chair. So again, we're, I'm going to pull um, the legislation for BEBC based off of um, the grant that forgivable loan grant from the city. And um, I just want to conclude by thanking those council members who reached out to Mr. Garrett and who were very supportive of him and the students and really encourage um, us all to, you know, be supportive and visit the school because he's really doing a great thing and he's created 37 jobs here in the city and those people live here, work here, pay taxes here. And I think that is commendable and he's done a phenomenal job. So thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Did anybody have any questions, any concerns? Uh, the author of the legislation that asked for its withdrawal, we will do that. We have just one more item to come before the committee. Authorizing the exec execution of a relocation grant agreement with Babcox and Wilcott Company to support job creation in Akron City, uh, in the city of Akron, and declaring an emergency. We have with us this afternoon Mr. Dale Roth. Thank you, Chairwoman Sims and uh, committee. The uh, administration is seeking approval um, for a relocation grant agreement to be made with Babcock and Wilcox. Um, the, there will be approximately 800 jobs moving to the city of Akron. Um, a good portion of those, um, or the majority of those are coming from Barberton, approximately 600, about 120 from uh, the Copley Jed, and about 100 from North Carolina. The exact numbers won't really be known until the move actually happens, but um, we expect to um, see an additional a million five hundred sixty-two thousand dollars in income tax, payroll taxes collected every year for um, by the city of Akron. Part of that, one hundred fifty-six thousand, is belongs to Akron Public Schools for the um, bond repayment fund. But we will, for the first five years, share a portion of that back with Barberton to reduce the impact on Barberton. As you can well imagine, this is. Um, uh, you know, quite a blow uh, to their to their economy. Um, of that, then we will share part with uh, B and W, and then we'll still end up with a net gain for the city of Akron. Over a total of seven years, we'll be collecting about 10.9 million, a million of new funds towards the CLC bonds, uh, two million that we will share back with Barberton about 3.6 million that we will share with the company and still leave the city of Akron with a net gain of 4.1 million. Thank you, Ms. O'Dell. Uh, and that's, that's over the seven year period? That's over seven years. So is, is there any it's also there? contingent upon the actual payroll and you know all the numbers actually happening. Okay. Any questions for the committee? So, you know, this is really exciting, of course. Anytime we get a second headquarter, I think, coming, we have Huntington, now we have uh, Babcox and Wilcox coming. So the explanation for how the, the loan will come about is uh, directly splitting a portion of the payroll income tax with Babcox and Wilcox. Ab yes. That will, that will on the annual, we're talking a half a million dollars a year. That's a part of the relocation yes. fee. Um, so the, I guess the same question we asked uh, relative to Huntington, how will we ensure uh, that we're maintaining uh, the number of uh, jobs? That so it, it's on an if come basis. So. Um, Let's say they started January 2019, and that is not abs absolutely not going to happen. It's more likely that they're in there at the end of 19 or beginning of 20. But whatever the new payroll is for that particular year, they have to do you know all their reconciliation with the city of Akron tax department. There's a particular form called an AW3 that reconciles their W2s with um, what their payroll actually was. Take that in, you know, April after their their 
you know, their reconciliation is done and we have an actual form that's been certified and we use that then to do all the calculations. We also, at the end of this year, will be getting something from Barberton that shows what they actually collected in Barberton you know, during their last full year as well. So we kind of need to get all those pieces in place. And again, the number that we share back with Barberton and with Babcock and Wilcox is completely dependent upon what the total number is that Babcock and Wilcox pays to their employees here in Akron. Very good, so on average, we're talking about salaries of about what? Around 93,000. So these are very good salaries. The vast majority of the employees are um, engineers, and now with the headquarters, we'll be getting more some of the um, you know back office people as well. So recently, we saw in the newspaper some questions about uh, the presence of B and W on the in, uh, New York Stock Exchange. The impact of that on. Oh. It's certainly, you know, it's never good news to see, um, you know, stock prices going down, but the entire stock market, you know, if you look at all the indexes have been going down recently, and if you look at the peers for B&W in that um, energy, um, you know, industry group, they've also gone down. The price of a stock does not always reflect the actual value of a company. I mean, the fluctuations that you see in the stock market most often reflect um, people's fears about what's happening politically or in, in our country or in the world. You know, it certainly has some you know, impact. The economy has an impact on it as well, but it's really you know, not a direct core. I don't feel that it's a direct correlation. Okay. Any, any questions from the committee? Any questions from many members of council? Mr. Fusco. Thank you, Chairman Sims. Um, no, this is, uh, this is great to see. We were, weren't we um, kind of in a competition, if you will? Um, there was another area that they were looking at in the country. Well, they were looking at North Carolina. They were, I mean, their choices were, they had decided that the building they were in in Barberton was not, um, functioning well for them there, and the majority of their employees in this particular division are in Barberton. Um, they had 650,000 square feet in that building, and they only need about 175,000 square feet, so they definitely were going to be moving somewhere. And they felt that their two choices was either, you know, keep all those employees. I mean, this is, you know, the majority of people that are employed in Barberton will stay employed. I mean, it's not like, you know, another 20 minutes is going to change um, <laughs> their, you know, their likelihood of leaving that job. Um, now, if they had had to move all those people to North Carolina, it would have been, a, you know, a mu uh, probably have had a much bigger impact on turnover for them. So, you know, we were I think it was, you know, a good decision that the company made, and certainly to to, to stay in this area. But yeah, their second choice was North I Carolina. Just, I just want to congratulate um, economic development folks, uh, Mayor Horrigan. This is a this is a very big deal, and it, it it's also indicative, I think, of um, how we operate here in the city of Akron. You know, the East End project was one of the largest investments in Summit County's history at the time in terms of, you know, creating that space. And now we're seeing that, you know, with the SUMA uh, staying in Akron, with, you know, with, with this here st staying in Summit County, um, you know, and converting that Class B space into Class A space, uh, which is what this will be, um, it's, just, it's just positioning ourselves for even more success, I believe, in terms of, uh, you know, developing this area, investing in this area. Keep Goodyear here, number one is what that was, but then again, reutilizing this space, just like the, uh, the old BF Goodrich headquarters, right? Mm -hmm. Go Joe's there today, and across the street where General, uh, not General, I'm sorry, but the, um, um, the uh, space across from Go Joe there, that, uh, that was old rubber uh, manufacturing space over there, so. It was uh, Goodrich, and then it Goodrich. was Michelin. Michelin, right, but, but all these I'm sorry, older buildings and positioning ourselves 
like I said, to be able to take that space and, and find a way to, to utilize it. And, and, the, and those kind of investments have a return on investment, and that's exactly what this is. And it's, uh, again, congratulations. Like I said, this is, this is truly a competition. This was, sounds like a national competition, but. It was, and I think what we have found with um, Babcock and Wilcox is that their concerns were really some of the same concerns that we had with Firestone and with Goodyear and that with Huntington, and uh, we're seeing companies that, um, you know, need a more modern facility. Um, they need some modern amenities around those facilities. Um, their ability to not only function as a company, but retain, hire and retain younger workers, which, you know, I, I'm a lot closer to the, the retirement end than the starting end, and we all are looking for, you know, younger people to come in and start taking those places. Um, B&W felt that by being in this area where there's a hotel, um, where there's going to be a Starbucks across the street, while there's a gym, there's uh, potential housing, there's, you know, all, every, you know, and maybe 15 minutes from downtown, that this is the kind of place that their new employees, as they start to replace retiring, retiring staff with younger staff, is going to be a lot easier for them to, um, to hold on to those people. Thank you for your comments, uh, Councilman. Ms. Thank you. I don't want to go too far away from your legislation, but now that Adele is here, I have a question. Um, when they move into their facility over there, I, I just think about the parking. I grew up on Kelly Avenue when Goodyear was there, and, and in the evening when you heard that, 